Hi, this is question three from the exam Baha'i. We're told in the introduction that the year end is December and they work in the vacation industry. So that's the introduction to the question. Very straightforward. First requirement is about impairment. So even before you read the scenario, we remember, don't we, that you have to do impairment calculation if there's an impairment indicator, that you then have to write down assets if necessary to recoverable amount, and any loss would go in the profit and loss. So now we can go back to the scenario. If you need to, please pause the recording while you look back through the scenario. As you look through, there seem to be a lot of potential impairment indicators, aren't there? So don't look for things that will be difficult to explain, like the price to book ratio. We understand it. The price would be three pounds. The book value of the assets, 10 pounds. Yeah, I understand that, but that's gonna be quite hard to explain, isn't it? But look for other things that are easier to explain because you can see again, the fact that they're negotiating with their creditors. We can see that generally the industry is having a rough time, that there were losses again, um, which were 40% of the carrying amount of the ship. They can't put their selling prices up. So there are all sorts of things that indicate there might be impairment indicator. Perhaps understandably, the directors don't particularly want to do the calculation in case they get a big loss in their profit and loss account. So bring together your knowledge of impairment and the scenario, explain some of those impairment indicators and the conclusion that you would draw. So here we're saying that Here's my knowledge, first of all, that if there is an impairment indicator, you must do the calculation where you must compare carrying amount and recoverable amount. Recoverable amount, again, takes account of the fair value and also value in use. Now, go then to the scenario. Look for things that are impairment indicators. So, Overcapacity in the market, so people are simply not going on cruises or not enough people. Uh, selling prices are not going up. Companies, other companies are writing down their assets. There have been losses on sale of ships. If you negotiate with suppliers, it means you can't afford to pay them. It also said in the scenario that at the moment, <clears throat> They haven't got any expert in. Ah, uh, there it is. So the directors think it's only fallen by 2%, but that's not from a valuer. So that might be completely unreliable. So we're also saying, aren't we, that there's no expert input. So they need to do a proper impairment review. There's the first requirement. Let's take a look at the second part of the question. Oh, defer tax. Well, let's be calm. We're fine. We can do it, can't we? First of all, should you recognise a deferred tax asset? And secondly, can you offset the deferred tax liability and the deferred tax asset. So we've got our two parts of the question. Should I recognise the asset? And secondly, can I offset the asset and the liability? So first part is about deferred tax asset. 
If you need to, pause the recording and read the scenario. So what do we know about deferred tax? We know that it arises because of temporary differences. We know that temporary differences are where things are expensed in one year, allowed for tax in another year. Or things are credited to income in one year, taxed in the next year. What we've got here is something that is expensed in one year. Because they're saying there's a deferred tax, they must be getting the tax relief later. Now you don't need any tax knowledge, but you should be saying to yourself, if you go to the tax authority and say, I wish to write down all of my receivables, because they're not going to pay me, can I have some tax relief? The tax authority will say no. You only can write them down when we have a letter and it basically shows that receivable will definitely not pay. Otherwise, people use this to plan out their profits. Now, if you've got an allowance for bad debts, that's a credit balance. So deferred tax will be a debit balance, an asset. That always works, doesn't it? If you had a revaluation upwards, that's an asset. Deferred tax is a liability. If you have a pension liability, deferred tax is an asset. If you have a lease liability, deferred tax is an asset. If you have a provision for unrealised profit, that's a credit, deferred tax is an asset. Are there any exceptions? No. So this is a credit balance allowance for bad debts so there's bound to be a deferred tax asset the company has just started to recognize bad debts i don't know why doesn't matter but anyway they've started to recognize bad debts at the start of the year they must have had an allowance like this with the related deferred tax asset I think probably the allowance must have got bigger. There's been a change. If the deferred tax asset has gone up by five, I guess the allowance must have gone up, the bad debt allowance. Don't call it a provision, by the way. It's allowance. Now, are there any rules about that? It's just the matching principle. It's absolutely fine. When you recognise the bad debt, debit p &L, Credit allowance for bad debt, when you recognise the deferred tax. Other way round, debit deferred tax asset, credit p &L. So it's fine. There's nothing there. It's um, special. Do you recognise the deferred tax asset? Yes, you can. So in respect of that first requirement there, do I recognise the deferred tax asset? Yeah. It's what you do. It's standard deferred tax accounting. So the change in the um, expected credit loss, the bad debt is an accounting estimate, isn't it? Because how much money you're going to get in. So the deferred tax asset is like the other side, the accounting estimate as well, the extra tax relief you'll get. So they'll put a credit to, to the tax charge of 5 million in the P&L. Do they recognise it? Yeah. The only situation when they have um, prudence coming out is things like losses. If you've got a net loss in the accounts, can you recognise the deferred tax asset? It depends on whether you're going to make profits in the future. Nothing to do with losses here, is it? This is just about bad debts. Can you offset? Ah, tricky question. Now, you see... If I was a single company and I had a liability to the tax people and an asset from the tax people, I'd normally offset them. But these are two separate legal persons. You know, so it's you, Yan, and Bohai. They're two separate legal entities. So one of them has got a deferred tax liability. The other one has got a deferred tax asset. 
it would be almost like me saying my my son has a liability I have an asset please can we offset them it's not going to happen is it rules on offset mean there must be the same taxable authority and there must be again the ability to offset it's not going to happen it's not going to be allowed so they need to show the liability and the asset separately so there's the rule from the standard you can only offset if there's a legally enforceable right with the same tax authority separate legal personality two companies you can't offset liability will be on the credit side of the balance sheet asset on the debit side now let's move on to the next part of the question requirement c how do we account for the lease and non-lease components of the cruise ship right thinking about revenue and thinking about leases so presumably the bit that is um, leases will be in line with IFRS 16 and the other bits the other services we provide presumably we provide other services will be more about IFRS 15 be calm pause the recording for a minute if you need to just to remind yourself about the scenario so they lease cruise ships out there's the first thing operating leases that makes sense because the life of a big ship I don't know what it is but it must be 40 years or something mustn't it I'd have thought and they just rent them out for five years so some of the money is coming in from these operating leases fine demonstrate knowledge of the leasing standard the rest of the money is coming in for other things so what are those other things well I can see there are two types of other things there is fuel and food in addition <clears throat> there is maintenance and cleaning again you don't have to work for a cruise liner to get to the bottom of this you don't have to have been on a cruise you probably haven't I'm very old so I have been but it doesn't really help me with the question I promise you we just have to read the scenario don't we as far as the fuel and food goes it says that the lessee that's the cruise line goes into port and the captain will go and speak to the local so I guess they go around the local shop and they say hello I want to buy some rice and potatoes the negotiation is being done by the captain well I suppose the captain will send someone else won't they very tempting to do a pirate accent but I don't think I will so the fuel and food is bought directly by the um, person who's renting the boat and then as it says here the local shop bills Bohai and then we charge them some kind of fee perhaps we add 10% on okay that's all right I understand the other bit's different isn't it so the maintenance and cleaning seems to be coming direct from Bohai in which case again with the maintenance and cleaning I suppose it's something that we are physically doing ourselves well getting someone to do anyway so when you try and can contrast those the fuel and food is bohai again and then the cruise ship which is negotiating directly with the local company the other one is much more about what bohai does directly now we see this word down don't we down here about acting as principal so that's surely saying isn't it 
Are we a principal or are we an agent? And when you look at the food and fuel supplies, this one here that I'm just highlighting in green, it sounds more like we're acting as agent. And if we're acting as agent, in which case, perhaps we should just be booking the commission that we charge, again, as opposed to the total price of the food and fuel. It's not my rice, it's not my diesel, or whatever you put into ships. I'm simply acting as a kind of organising the billing agent. So there's a lot there, isn't there? And it would we'd have to make sure we keep our sentences short and sweet. Otherwise, the marker will end up even more muddled up than we were when we first read the question. Here are my points down here. We do need to separate out the components. So, what are the performance obligations? There's three. There is the lease, there's the maintenance and cleaning, and the fuel and food. And then remember, from your revenue recognition model, having decided what those obligations are, <clears throat> they will then, if necessary, need to allocate the revenue thinking about things like standalone selling prices if that's relevant it's a good job we don't have to do any numbers isn't it so you can see what i've done there first of all is said this is really three questions it's a question about the lease a question about the maintenance a question about the fuel now here's my answer on the lease here's my answer on the maintenance and here's my answer on the fuel on the lease, it's an operating lease. On the lease, it's an operating lease. So, <clears throat> again, how do you book an operating lease? In the balance sheet, you have PPE. In the P&L, you've got your revenue, and of course you'll have your depreciation of the ship. Maintenance. We're acting as principal, so we negotiate the price at the start of the contract, recognize gross revenue, and then of course you'll have your gross cost of sales as well. Food and fuel, we're just an agent. The lessee is negotiating directly with the supplier. They're taking that responsibility, so we will just show management fee. So in my P&L, what have I got? I've got my lease rentals coming in. I've got my maintenance and cleaning fee and the commission on the food and fuel. And so we've unraveled that quite complex scenario. That's the end of this debrief.